I came into this hole and saw, saw it as you see it now, the burnt out stairway, the sledgehammer marks in the hall, and uh, the wreckage and carnage that there was. The one thing which I could see then, and I wasn't able to put a name on it until later on that evening, was the hatred that must have gone into the wrecking of this home. But I don't believe anybody stole anything for personal gain. But those who were doing this wrecking were doing it with real hatred in their hearts. Jerry Fitt, a Belfast politician for 32 years, but today without a job, a party, or even a home. Beaten at the ballot box and now burned out of Belfast by his former supporters, he sits in a London park considering the future. It's a future which may include a peerage, the right to sit among the noblemen of Britain. It's a curious end for an Irish Republican socialist. Last week, Weldon Action took Jerry Fitt back to Belfast to find out how the former Irish troublemaker became the hero of British politicians, press and Ulster Protestants. And how, at the same time, he was rejected by his own Catholic people in favour of the spokesman of the bullet and the bomb. Because to many Ulster Catholics, Jerry Fitt committed the unforgivable sin. He left his tribe. He let the people down. He turned his back on the people. And he knows it now. There's no need to cry. He can cry over there all he wants to Margaret Thatcher. It'll do him no good to him. He's not welcome. What was he like when he was first elected? A human being he was then. Yeah. People somebody people somebody could get to touch with the people. Knew exactly what their problems were. But he spent too much time in London, and he doesn't have a problem to tell me. Lord Jerry Fitz's his name now. That's his name, Lord. And do you think that's an honour for him? An honour? It's a disgrace. Disgrace to people on the New Lodge Road. There is a thing in, right throughout Ireland, because people in Ireland, and I think history has proven it, that they go all out of their way to put someone up on a, on a pedestal. They certainly did with me. I had tremendous success in Ireland, but it is an old thing, an old irony of Irish history that once they get you on that pedestal, then they start blowing it up or chipping it away. It has happened to many, many other politicians and public figures in Northern Ireland without me. Jerry Fitt's political pedestal as an MP was built on a wave of Catholic resentment about injustice in Northern Ireland. He whipped up Catholic anger, and his first speeches to the Commons in 1968 infuriated the traditional party of power in Northern Ireland as Unionist MP Harold McCusker recalls. He seemed to epitomise all that was anti-unionist in Northern Ireland, all that seemed to indicate total antipathy to the, the Protestant and unionist viewpoint. And if one wanted to turn on a, a, politi a unionist political meeting at that time, you just used his name, and his name triggered off all the hostility which would exist in unionists to Republicans and to nationalists. If Unionists feared that Fitt threatened their political domination of Northern Ireland, they were right. In October 1968, Fitt escalated his battle for justice for the Catholics. He was among the leaders of a civil rights march through Londonderry. That night, British MPs and television viewers saw for the first time the treatment Catholics could expect from the Protestant-dominated Royal Ulster Constabulary. The Unionists had a great affection for Derry. Therefore, they thought that it was something of a cheek or effrontery for Catholics to want to march through particular areas of the city of Derry. The route had been deliberately chosen to provoke the Protestants, and Jerry Fitt made sure the Westminster MPs and cameras he'd invited were nearby after he clashed with an RUC man. I've got three stitches in my head at the moment, but uh, I will say this, that three stitches will not deter me from carrying on the fight which I have undertaken on behalf of the ordinary people of this country you were going into that situation knowing that there would be trouble, you would come against the police, and you were actually, in a way, courting violence in order to make a political point. I don't point. think I was courting violence. I would rather that the police had stood back and let everyone march, because after all, it was a quite serious demonstration and demand for minimum reforms in the law, and they were really minimum. Though the civil rights demands were modest, there were those in the crowd with more radical demands. Among the march organizers was this man, a young Republican who was to rise through the ranks of the movement and is widely believed to have directed the IRA terror campaign of the 70s. Fifteen years later, he would dislodge Jerry Fitt and replace him in the general election. He was Jerry Adams, 
and he and others were determined that the battle for civil rights should become a battle for a united Ireland, fought not at Westminster, but on the streets. For Unionists, the violence was the inevitable result of Fitz's rousing of Catholic discontent. If he had known the monster that he was almost a midwife to by taking such a leading part in the anti-Unionist campaign and the civil rights campaign, that if he had known that this monster was going to be spawned, he wouldn't perhaps have taken the line he took on those occasions. Do you feel but, that there was a sense in which you and some other politicians in the Civil Rights Association were used by the men of violence who were waiting in the wings to take I advantage think of it? The men of violence were really in existence then to use everybody, but I think there is absolutely no doubt that once they saw the Catholic population were willing to come out onto the streets in sufficient numbers to demonstrate for what they consider to be their just rights, then the IRA certainly moved in. And in 1970, they began their shooting war. Their targets were the security forces and the British Army, who had at first been welcomed by the Catholics, until they felt that they, more than Protestants, were the subject of harassment and curfew. <laughs> Fitt's campaign was overwhelmed as the murders and bombing campaign got underway. One of the first and most appalling loyalist bombings was at McGurk's Bar. The 15 Catholic deaths had a profound effect on the local MP. I heard a tremendous explosion and I ran down here. It was absolute pandemonium and everyone was trying to dig out the people who had been in the bar. I, in fact, pulled the body, the two legs of the body, and I think in the process I felt the body disintegrating. I got rather ill at the time. They were all Catholics in that bar. I knew every one of their families. I knew all their relations at, at the moment. And those relations are all forgotten about. And then there were other bones. There was the Bloody Friday bones, which were, which were the result of the IRA activities, the killing of the soldiers, the Shankill Butchers, which was the loyalist murder gangs who killed Catholics. There was the, the Ballanderry bombs, the Bally Kelly bombs, which were set off by the INLA. So far as I was concerned, I could never find sympathy with anyone, be he Catholic or Protestant, Republican or Loyalist, who was setting about to maim and to murder. The elected spokesman of the Catholic tribe was condemning his own side as well as opponents. There was unease among his closest supporters and anger among those like Gerry Adams who supported violence. If you're elected, you have to reflect the views of the people who elect you. And Gerry Fidd increasingly uh, refused to reflect those views. Jerry Fitt did, did was singularly lacking. Did elected him believe that it was right to be shooting British soldiers on the street? Well, I think that a section of the people who elected him certainly felt that because we did take uh, fits from Mr. votes from Mr. Fitt. But that was, uh, we're talking about 10 years ago. Did they support the shooting of British soldiers on the streets then? I would say so. Okay. It's, hard, it's hard to say, but I would say so. I mean, the, the, the new law area, uh, the dock area and the falls area was an area which felt uh, the, the very brutal accesses of British forces. But he can hardly have considered it a mandate as a member of parliament to condone that kind of violence. Well, that's entirely up, up to himself. I think that, I mean, that his fate is proof of how much he's distanced himself from the people who elected him. Many who elected him regarded distant Westminster as the parliament of the British, not the Irish, and were disenchanted as he merged easily into life there. Barney Gowdy had campaigned for fit in several elections. Well, after some years, the change came over fit. Gradually, he lost his Irish identity, and he became part of the establishment. And a man with stronger character could have withstood these pressures. I would imagine fit from his humble background was awed by the type of people he would meet at Westminster. And a man with that character tends to go wherever the famous and the beautiful people are to be found. Now supporting any attempt to halt the increasing violence, Fitt cooperated in power sharing with the Unionists at Stormont. But the sight of Fitt shaking hands with the hated Brian Faulkner turned anger into contempt. Hello, Brian. Good morning, Jerry. Yet the two of them were arch enemies. Here was Fitt, a man who condemned Faulkner, left, right and centre. Here was Faulkner, a man who condemned Fitt, left, right and centre. But when it suited both of them, they could get together. Brian Faulkner and I deliberately referred to each other by our Christian names and we shook hands in an attempt to bring some of those people away from confrontation to see if we could reach any accommodation to learn to live together in Northern Ireland. It was a calculated gesture 
and uh, it, it, it was seen to be as such by some of the most extreme elements within this community. Power sharing in Stormont was consumed in violence and Protestant strikes, and there followed eight years in which the heart was bombed out of Belfast. <laughs> One has only got to go around Catholic West Belfast or Protestant East Belfast to see the terrible tragedy that has happened. Uh, the bricked up houses, the concrete blocks, I'm not too sure who it was invented concrete blocks, but he certainly made himself a fortune. And they haven't been very effective in keeping uh, areas uh, closed. And then um, the peace line in Belfast. I think that's a very, very sad commentary on Northern Ireland where in the Falls Road, you have a very large high wall, Berlin wall, to keep the Protestants and Catholics apart. It's going to be very hard to bring about a community effort to rebuild Belfast and to try to create a city in which Catholics and Protestants can both live together. As Fitt condemned extremists from all sides, the men of violence and the mob turned on him. His home in the Antrim Road became a symbol of his stand. A television camera, bulletproof windows and wire netting to deflect petrol bombs protected his family from many attacks. On the streets outside, every corner is a memorial to a dead soldier or policeman or Catholic or Protestant and Jerry Fitt remembers them all. This here's an area where a lot of people were killed. On the morning that Bobby Stans died, a milkman with his young son were delivering milk and they came up there and a stone was thrown at the milkman and it hit him on the face. He crashed the car and both he and his young son were killed. And just there at the New Lodge Road, that was where the first British soldier was killed, Gunner Robert Curtis. And down that second street there was the first Irish man who was killed. A wee fellow called Danny O'Hagan was killed there. And there was a loyalist demonstration just up here and a police constable, Constable Arbuckle, was killed by a loyalist. I can recall of a little baby killed called Angela Gallagher, who was killed by an IRA stray bullet. And uh, the spokesman for the IRA at that time said, well, this is a war and you have to expect civilian casualties. By 1980, the IRA sought a new weapon in the propaganda war. And at the Mays prison, Republicans began a hunger strike for political status. This was to bring the most important decision of Fitz's life. He called a meeting of his wife and five daughters that I said to them, if I was wise, I would say nothing. If I was even more wise, I would go out and lead the next hunger strike demonstration through the heart of my constituency on the Falls Road. I would be carried shoulder high, I would be a folk hero, but I would know what I was doing would be wrong. I would be helping to keep young men on hunger strike, knowing that inevitably it would lead to their deaths. I couldn't do that. And yet I, I took the decision with my wife and kids. I said, it may mean that I'll never win any more elections. You will be hearing, are you prepared to stand by and see the coffins coming out of Long Cash? Well, all I want to say is I don't want to see any coffins coming out of Long Cash. But I didn't want to see any coffins coming out of little churchyard and little chapels throughout the length and breadth of Northern Ireland when the victims of those murderers were being carried out. I don't want to see any coffins coming out, but I cannot forget how many funerals took place of the victims of those men of violence. Now, whatever you feel about what he said, do you not feel that it was courageous of him to make that stand? I think he totally underestimated the feeling within his constituents about the issue. But he was I think brave to go against his own constituents. But he didn't he know he was going right, against his he? own constituents. He didn't know that. You have to bear in mind that Jerry Fitt has been an absentee MP for many, many years, that he has spent more time in London than he has in the streets of Belfast. And I don't believe for one moment that he, that he realised the gut feeling in those areas against the British occupation. But Fitt was expecting trouble, and when it came, it was alarming. His wife Anne was alone in the house when a thousand people carrying flaming torches gathered. They were beating a drum, you know, at intervals. It was very sinister. If they'd been shouting or something, like, I mean, I could, 
live with that because I've been used to it. It happened so many times before, but I became very alarmed at uh, this sinister thing that where they were beating the drums and everything, and I, I, I became frightened of what they were going to do. Jerry Fitt returned home next day to witness a repeat of the previous night's events. And this time they were shouting abuse. They were shouting Jerry Fitt is a Brit and a lot of other foul and abusive language. And as I looked out of my parlour window, I could see a woman aged about 60 and her daughter who was aged about 40. And I recognised them as being some of my more fervent political supporters who had been helping me in elections over many years. And I was very saddened to see this. I was on a Thursday evening. Well, the following Sunday, I was coming from Mass in Donegal Street, and I met this old lady coming out, and I challenged her, or I asked her, why was she standing outside my house and gazed in Jerry Fit as a Brit? She was rather shamefaced about it, and I think that she and I would still have a relationship. But she then went on to tell me that her two grandsons were in Long Cash for the murder of a policeman. And that answered a whole lot of questions for me. Could I be expected to ask that woman, who was my great electoral supporter, to run away and to disavow her belief in her own flesh and blood, her own sons, or to support me against them? If you take that case, you can multiply it by a thousandfold, and you will see what the troubles have cost in Northern Ireland. In an agonising seven months, ten IRA hunger strikers were to die, while Mrs Thatcher, supported by Jerry Fitt, stood firm. Did you ever feel that a man who is starving himself to death over a principle deserves to be listened to perhaps more than they were listened to at that time? I think it was right to listen to them, but I, because they were intent on committing suicide, on murdering themselves, and I don't attach such blame to the actual victims of the hunger strike, but to the people who were outside, they had taken a conscious decision, come what may, they wanted some of their own men to die. I made a speech in the House of Commons at that time, and I said that a dead or dying hunger strike striker was a more lethal weapon, or the most lethal weapon, in the armoury of the IRA, far out doing any bombs or bullets or armalite rifles. The IRA were intent on sentencing their own men to death and thereby involving the whole Catholic population. The hunger strikers failed to win their demands, but 10 deaths captured the sympathy of much of the Catholic population. And when Mrs. Thatcher called the election, the Republicans took full advantage. Jerry Adams, a provisional Sinn Féin, opposed Fit in West Belfast and predicted Fit would get a derisory vote. Gerard Adams. Sinn Féin. 16,379. Gerard Fit. Independent. 10,326. Fit lost by 6,000 votes. And throughout the province, more than 100,000 people voted for the spokesmen of the men of violence. Don't you think it means that there are 100,000 people in Northern Ireland who are prepared to vote for a solution through the bullet and the bomb? I have no doubt that a section of the people who voted for Sinn Féin did so because they would be passive or active supporters of the IRA. I can't quantify that. Uh, other people voted for us on other issues. But certainly one can say that the vote very clearly shows an understanding of the reason why the IRA engages in resistance. Not content with Fitt's defeat at the ballot box, Republican anger brimmed over 12 days ago when a gang broke into his home. Well, this is the living room where we have lived now for the past 19, nearly 20 years. And we've had very happy times in this living room. I won many elections here over this past many years, in the late 60s and the early 70s. This was our kitchen. It's hard to believe that only a week ago, my young granddaughter, who lives in Dublin with her mother, was up here in Belfast, and my wife was doing a washing. And I have a photograph at home where my young daughter, taken just a week ago, where she'd been bathed in that sink. My granddaughter was very happy about the whole thing. This was my stairway. Right there was my bathroom. And that there was my young daughter's room, Geraldine. I haven't got my wife and youngsters here because I wouldn't want them to see this because my wife is still saying, why did people with such hatred want to do us such damage? And they took all the furniture that Anne and I had gathered up over so many years and they took it out there and burnt it. 
probably because I didn't support the tribal uh, military activities of the IRA or spoke against the hunger strike. This is the price you have to pay for it. Well, if it is, I'm certainly not going to run away from it. Jerry Fitt has said that the people who broke into his home and smashed up his furniture and burnt all his belongings were members of the IRA and that they were cowards. Do you support either of those? Well, I don't think statements? for one moment that the people involved were members of the IRA. In fact, the IRA have denied that. Uh, I, I believe that, they're, that they are young people uh, who just feel very strongly about the issue. I don't think they should have done it. I've said publicly it only gives him the opportunity to uh, gain some credibility. Uh, I don't think his family should be put through the hardship they were put through. But if you like, it's, it's a sort of a, an acid test of the gut feeling against what Jerry Fitz stood for. I've always tried to help everybody, no matter who they were. And I, I feel that this was sort of an attack on me, more so than at any other time in the past. And I just feel very let down, and I feel that there were many people who observed this whole thing because it wasn't done in five minutes, who could have done something about it. And I just feel like as if I haven't got too many friends left around there anymore. And I haven't got a home. Today, after election defeat and after being burned out of his home, Jerry Fitt receives a warm welcome in Belfast's shopping centre. And he believes that behind every smile and handshake, there's a good wish. People who smile at me and shake me by the hand uh, would either have voted for me or would have wanted to have voted for me. People who didn't vote for me or were politically opposed to me would take the other side of the street or give me a, an awful glare. But people don't shake my hand or come over and be friendly with me if they voted against me. Does it upset you that walking around your home city you have to take a bodyguard everywhere with you? I'm very concerned about that. And it may be that none of the paramilitary organisations have taken a conscious decision that they would want to kill me. I believe if they did take that decision then there would be no way at all of preventing it. It's the maverick the fellow who has a gun and uh, he is related to someone who has either been imprisoned or a hunger striker and he would see me and he would probably go and get that gun. Again, you cannot take any adequate uh, prevent steps to prevent that. Do you think the next 15 years in Northern Ireland will be like the last 15 years? Yeah, I think unfortunately that that's going to be the situation until someone somewhere with authority says we're going to disengage from that situation. I think that the uh, demise of Jerry Fit. Uh, and I don't want to be triumphalistic, the demise of Jerry Fitt uh, will help that process. That the British government haven't got a puppet MP who they can wind up and try to, to justify their actions in our country. You're saying that the, the bombings and shootings will continue until the other side compromises, but you won't? No, I'm not saying that at all. I, I've stated quite clearly what I've said. The British government, for as long as it's been here, has uh, presided over ongoing tragedy in social, economic, military terms. And that the British government, therefore, needs not to compromise, to get out. If an Irish socialist politician receives a peerage, it's regarded in England as a great honour. You'll appreciate that in some areas of Ireland it's regarded as something rather different. I know there are very many good socialists in the House of Lords at Westminster. I can think of Fenner, Brockway, and Manny Shinwell, many, many more. And those people certainly hasn't, haven't given up their socialism. They are using the system. The House of Lords is a, a second chamber, and it can be used to advance the cause of socialism. Now, in Ireland, certainly, I, I am not unaware of the fact that all those people who were so viciously opposed to me, particularly the IRA, they would be very happy if after being defeated in that last election, after being burnt out of my home, I were to be seen signing on at the local Labour Exchange, that would certainly give them a good fill-up. I'm not going to sign on at the local Labour Exchange. In the last eight days, the Republicans have demonstrated their contempt for the British by holding a hunger strike commemoration at the scene of the murder of Lord Louis Mountbatten. And last week, the Loyalist band struck up, as they have for hundreds of years, to celebrate the victory of Protestant William of Orange over the Catholics at the Battle of the Boyne. There have been six deaths, 18 explosions, and nearly 900 petrol bombs thrown. One of the few Northern Irish voices willing to condemn every act of violence is without a political platform, for the moment. <laughs>